Well, thanks very much for that introduction, Carol. Can I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past and present. I also acknowledge the distinguished representatives of the nine universities of Queensland here tonight. Uh, well, this uh, facility really lives up to its name, doesn't it? It's wonderful to, to be with you tonight. And uh, I want to thank the, the nine universities for their invitation to speak today about the Racism and Stops With Me campaign. It's a source of immense pride that the campaign enjoys such resolute and uniform support from the universities of this great state. The fight against racial prejudice and discrimination is one about education. It's about changing people's thinking and attitudes and empowering people to stand up for equality and justice. So it's only fitting that we have the support of universities. And I want to say that our universities play a crucial role in helping to set the tone of our public life, not only as seats of learning, but also as the training grounds for citizenship. What we see on campus, in our classrooms, lecture theatres, on our lawns, in our quads, is a model for what our society could be. It's a picture of citizens from all backgrounds and from many nations living and learning together, sometimes, yes, in disagreement, but ultimately in a spirit of inquiry and animated by a desire for knowledge. And this is how it's always been for the modern university. As an institution, the modern university emerged from what historians have called the Republic of Letters. In the late 17th and 18th centuries in Europe, scholars and intellectuals committed to the sharing of knowledge would communicate by letters and pamphlets. Literary and scientific academies were founded in the great European cities, Paris, London, elsewhere. But it wasn't until the late 1800s that universities became the natural home of arts, letters, and science. Before that time, universities were bastions of scholasticism, defined by monistic practices where learning was focused on ancient texts. As Glyn Davis has described it in his Boyer Lectures of 2010, it was the Republic of Letters that encouraged universities to become lively, questioning institutions, concerned less with arid, abstract contemplation and more with how we should live. Through its support for our Racism It Stops With Me campaign, Queensland's universities are doing precisely this on matters of race and human rights. Encouraging people to ask important questions, to reflect upon how we should live, to put their values into action, and yes, to smash the barriers to justice. I will say a little bit more about the campaign shortly, but first, I believe it's important that we put some context on our understanding of racism today. It is more than appropriate, of course, for us to be here this evening having a conversation about race. The Saturday just passed, the 21st of March, marked the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Many of you, I suspect, might know the day better as Harmony Day. It's a day devoted to celebrating our cultural diversity. Schools mark Harmony Day with cultural festivals and performances. And increasingly, workplaces are encouraging people to share dishes reflecting their cultural heritage, to indulge, as it were, in a taste of harmony. Some of you may not know the background to Harmony Day. It was first marked in Australia in 1999, a time when Hansenism was still a political force, 
challenging the consensus on immigration and multiculturalism. Though there'd been an election pledge to introduce a national anti-racism campaign at the time, the then federal government opted to pursue a softer approach, hence the emphasis on cultural harmony. But it was feared at the time that many Australians would push back against any campaign that explicitly sought to tackle prejudice and discrimination. Now I think it's worth remembering some of this because there is, in my view, a very Australian way for us to talk about race. Often we talk about it in a way that averts the very mention of race. And this is because talking about race can seem to divide public opinion. There's certainly a pattern in the way that racism can be discussed or debated. Whenever bigotry, prejudice or discrimination is revealed on the national stage, all of us can agree. We would never dream of endorsing it. We can all say, hand in our hearts, that racism is abhorrent. But before long, doubt emerges. Someone inevitably will ask, is Australia a racist country? Is this evidence of some essential racist character, some ineradicable racist stain in Australian society? Often the response to such questions is that of parochial defensiveness. According to this stance, Australians aren't nearly as racist as others around the world. We should, it's argued, reserve the word racism only for those instances when there has been racial violence or professions of racial superiority. Moreover, we're entitled to take offence when racism is alleged, for racism is the lowest judgment you could ever make of another person's character. For the parochialist to contemplate charging that a fellow Australian is racist is a mark of someone who likes to think the worst of their own country and compatriots. On the other hand, there's the path of self-flagellation. This is the position of those who believe that Australian nationhood is inseparable from racism. It's asserted that even modern sensibilities can never obliterate the old biases and assumptions rooted in notions of racial superiority. On this view, national myths about fairness and egalitarianism and about the happy harmony of multiculturalism merely serve to conceal the true nature of the national psyche. So long as there is an Australian national identity, so the argument runs, there will be racial exclusion. The only way to overcome this is to renounce nationalism in all its forms. Instead, let us embrace a cosmopolitanism in which people belong to a single community based on their common humanity. There's an alternative to these two extremes. After all, why should we accept the premise of questioning whether Australia is a racist country? Such a question may just miss the point. Every country is going to have its bigots, its prejudices, and its problems with discrimination. It's unhelpful, surely, to turn every incident involving racism into a test demanding of us a wholesale judgment about the Australian national character. A more objective view would recognise that today's Australia is largely free from the racial tensions and discrimination that afflict other societies. We should be able to take pride in our achievements as a multicultural immigrant society since the demise of the white Australia ideal. Other places like the United States and Britain may have periodic race riots, but such episodes here are rare. The Cronulla riot of 2005, for example, stands as an aberration. We've been largely untarnished by organized racism. We do not have the equivalents of the Ku Klux Klan, the Front National, or the English Defense League. Australia has also avoided the contagion of extremist movements that have gained significant popularity across Europe in response to immigration and the supposed Islamification of the West, or at least so far. Australia has, in short, been a country defined by social cohesion. Such qualities were most recently evident 
in December 2014, in the wake of the deadly Martin, siege, Martin Place siege in Sydney. In what most would regard as a terrorist attack, self-styled Sheikh Manharon Monas took 18 people hostage in a Lent chocolate cafe. Hours into the siege, as many of you would know, a large number of Australians demonstrated their solidarity with Muslim Australians through the viral I'll Ride With You social media campaign. Inspired by the Twitter hashtag I'll Ride With You, commuters from around the country offered to ride public transport with Muslims who may have felt vulnerable to any anti-Islamic sentiment stirred by the siege. The dominant response was one of unity, of Australians coming together and not allowing Muslims to feel unwelcome. None of this means we should be in denial about the challenge of maintaining cultural harmony and racial tolerance. A significant number of people remain affected by racism. The best research indicates that about 20% of Australians have experienced verbal racial abuse. About 5% have experienced racial violence in physical form. Clearly, there remains room for improvement. But any progress requires us to consider racial issues as the subjects of serious public debate. For this to happen, we should understand that racism is never as simple as it appears. It can be as much a product of ignorance or innocence as it is of anxiety and antagonism. And rather than always leaving us with moral clarity, racism can leave us with a sense of contradiction. To illustrate, let me share with you some personal examples. I've experienced many occasions in my current role when well-intentioned people have expressed to me their support for racial equality and multiculturalism, only then to proceed to compliment me on how well I speak English, given my ethnic heritage. <laughs> it happens, it happens. I've been subjected to threatening racial abuse in Sydney while travelling with a member of my staff by a taxi driver who was himself an immigrant from a non-European background. A few years ago in Canberra, within the space of a few hours, I went from feeling patriotic pride while attending an Australia Day event to being taunted by a car full of flag-draped youths making slit-eyed gestures while jeering, go home. Just a few examples. In all this, though, we shouldn't lose sight of our progress. We've had the opportunity to, opportunity to reflect on this in recent days with the sad passing of former Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser. There have been many fitting tributes for Mr Fraser, celebrating his commitment to racial equality, multiculturalism and human rights. On these matters, there's no doubting the importance of Mr Fraser's leadership. In his memoirs from about five years ago, Malcolm Fraser tells a story about his time as army minister in the 1960s, a job which required him to administer conscription during the Vietnam War. In a hotel bar in his Victorian electorate of Wannon, Fraser was upbraided by a constituent whose son's number had come up in the draft. Nine months later in the same pub, the same man would confront him again. This time, the man's son had married one of them, a Vietnamese. Mr Fraser would return a few months later yet again, and the man would accost him once more. Only this time, it was because he wanted to buy Mr Fraser a round. His son had brought home his new Vietnamese bride. And I quote, this is what the man said to Mr Fraser, that girl, she's the best thing that ever happened to our family. Now, it's always dangerous to reduce a political career to a single event or issue. Indeed, for a long time, many were ambivalent about the legacy of the Fraser, Fraser Prime Ministership because of the 1975 dismissal. Though, this became less so with the friendship that Mr Fraser would form with Mr Whitlam in their later years. Yet the episode in the pub in the Western District described by Mr Fraser was something that prefigured many of the changes in Australian society that would occur as a result of his period in office. The political historian Robert Mann 
writing one of the many articles about Fraser last Friday, described it best. The central achievement of Fraser as Prime Minister was that he had normalised the most significant cultural achievements of the Whitlam government in the fields of ethnicity and race. It was, for example, Whitlam who began the movement that would lead to Indigenous land rights, but it was under Fraser that land rights legislation would first be passed. Whitlam as Prime Minister was responsible for concluding the work of dismantling the White Australia policy and for making the first embrace of multiculturalism. Yet it was only under the conservative Fraser government that the old Australian ambition to assimilate migrants to an Anglo-Celtic norm was finally and definitively abandoned. Indeed, it was Fraser's decision as Prime Minister to accept in the late 70s and early 80s, close to 70,000 refugees from Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos uh, that made multiculturalism what it is today. Per head of population, Australia took in the largest number of refugees in the world. Until that point, there had been no significant influx of non-European immigrants in Australia, at least not since the 1800s. Australia did embark upon a program of mass immigration following the end of the Second World War, but the immigrants came from Europe, not Asia. That new multicultural Australia, which Whitlam had proclaimed, was at this time to face its first test. That Australia would pass that test owes much to Malcolm Fraser's political leadership. He was genuine in his humanitarianism and in his commitment to multiculturalism the latter embodied by his establishment of SBS. And we should remember that it was by no means inevitable that the Fraser government would decide, as it did, not only to take in Indo-Chinese refugees, but to do so in such large numbers. In 1979, or by 1979, there was clearly a refugee crisis. Camps throughout Southeast Asia were overflowing. Boats were arriving on Australian shores. The Department of Immigration, in fact, had warned that the arrival of these refugees would spark a hostile public reaction, stimulated by traditional fears of the yellow peril and concern about high unemployment. A politician more inclined to follow public opinion than to lead it may well have opted for a different course. In 2013, I had the opportunity to interview Malcolm Fraser for the documentary that I made for Radio National. I asked him about his reasons for embracing multiculturalism. Here's what he said. He said, I believed we had no option, no alternative. We couldn't live as an Anglo-Saxon outpost in this part of the world. And I thought the days of isolation, of exclusivity were just past. And I thought that sort of attitude was wrong. It was reminiscent of colonialism, and a sense of superiority which was totally and absolutely misplaced. So how do you explain to the community that has, in its origins and its attitudes, been Caucasian, Anglo-Saxon, Celtic, how do you explain to that community that the world is changing, that they've got to change? You talked about multiculturalism, about a stronger country through diversity, respect for all people. Australia just did not and does not have an alternative to multiculturalism. With the passing of Gough Whitlam and Malcolm Fraser, we have come to see the passing of a certain age. But the decisions made by Whitlam and Fraser, at least on matters of race, were emphatically the right ones. These figures remind us that some questions should sit above partisan politics, they remind us that political leadership can be about courage. It was only with figures such as Whitlam and Fraser that the racial attitudes associated with that old white Australia were definitively banished and rejected. Of course, we should never be complacent about such matters and there continue to be contests about race. We've seen this during the past year or so with the debates about the racial vilification provisions of the Racial Discrimination Act. 
As most of you would know, the federal government last year had proposed repealing Section 18C of the Act, a section which makes it unlawful to offend, insult, humiliate or intimidate others because of their race. As I've mentioned, debates about race can often divide more than unite. Yet throughout last year, the contest over Section 18C united Australians in one sense. There was an emphatic affirmation of our commitment to racial tolerance. There was opposition to the proposed reform to the RDA by multicultural and Aboriginal communities, by members of the legal profession, by human rights experts, by psychologists, by public health advocates, by churches, by civil society. Most were worried that amending the law would have the dangerous effect of licensing racial hatred. They also believed it was unclear why any change was necessary when the Act already provides a broad protection for artistic work, scientific inquiry and fair comment. Under the oft-forgotten Section 18D of the Act, even if something should cause offence on racial grounds, it may be exempt from being in contravention of the law so long as it's done reasonably and in good faith. Faced with such concern, the Abbott government would eventually abandon its legislative proposal in August 2014. Announcing the retreat, the Prime Minister said he had made a leadership call. I believe he made the right leadership call. The issue was briefly revisited this year in January, following the Islamist massacre of staff at the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo in Paris, some commentators called for an urgent reconsideration of Section 18C. It was argued that whether magazines' provocative cartoons about the Prophet Muhammad and racial groups to be published in Australia, it would be banned or shut down because of the Racial Discrimination Act. Let me make this clear. These arguments are simply misleading. While the Racial Discrimination Act covers the attributes of race, and that includes colour, ethnicity and national origin, it says nothing about religion. Conduct that offends people on religious grounds is beyond the scope of the legislation. Moreover, the case law has established that satirical cartoons, even those that may racially offend or insult people, is to be regarded as protected speech, if it's been done reasonably and in good faith. The legal boffins among you may remember the Brofo case, in which some cartoons found offensive by Aboriginal people on racial grounds were ultimately regarded as conduct exempted as artistic work and fair comment under Section 18D. In any case, the federal government in January this year did quickly reject calls for the Racial Discrimination Act debate to be revisited. The Prime Minister confirmed that there would be no changes. It remained his government's position that it would not proceed with a repeal. Taking a step back, we can all agree on some things. The public debate about the Racial Discrimination Act has been intense. At times, it has also involved some inaccurate depiction of the legislation. It's remarkable, for example, to find the frequency with which commentators have referred to people being prosecuted or charged under Section 18C. This makes little sense when the Act only provides for a civil protection against racial discrimination and vilification. Put very simply, you cannot be charged or prosecuted under Section 18C. All that the law means is that someone may complain about unlawful conduct, but in the first instance, this means only that the Australian Human Rights Commission will investigate and attempt to conciliate the matter between parties. It would be timely though for our community to reflect upon the broader significance and impact of the RDA. This year marks the 40th anniversary of the legislation. Passed by the Commonwealth Government in 1975, it was our nation's first piece 
of federal legislation concerning human rights and discrimination. Now, Australian society has changed significantly since the RDA came into force. In 1975, we had a population of 13 million. Today, our population is creeping towards 24 million. Ethnic and racial diversity has increased over that time as a result of immigration from countries in Europe, oh, sorry, in Asia and the Middle East. As well as this, there's been a softening of attitudes on race and multiculturalism. Surveys demonstrate strong public support for cultural diversity. The most recent Scanlon Foundation study of social cohesion, for example, found that 85% of respondents agreed that multiculturalism is a good thing. 85%. 58% agreed that the immigration intake in Australia is either about right or too low. For the most part, as I've said, the story of Australian multiculturalism since the 1970s has been one of extraordinary success. And the RDA has played an important role in this, providing the legislative architecture of racial equality. It embodies a statement from Australian society that we do not accept racial discrimination, that we are committed to the equal dignity of everyone in our community. It gives everyone the assurance that they will not be treated unfavourably or with contempt because of their race. If we consider Australia's past history of racial discrimination, this is no trivial feat of our legal and political culture. And while it's hard to measure the impact of a law, the RDA has also arguably shaped people's behaviour. On the matter of race, one early legal scholar of discrimination law put in the following terms, and I'll quote, the mere existence of the law itself affects prejudice. People usually agree with the law and internalise its values. This is because considerable moral and symbolic weight is added to a principle when it is embedded in legislation. The law embodying as it does the societally acceptable norm, constantly holds before people an image of what their feelings should be. Over an appreciable period, this cannot help but influence them in their private attitudes. As a result, while we may not be able to repeal prejudice by law, it is an essential part of the enterprise of education which alone can end prejudice. It's on this note of education that I'll return to the Racism It Stops With Me campaign. Now, I think it should go without saying that we can't rely upon legislation and legislation alone to achieve social change. It's pretty simple. It's just unrealistic for us to expect that the law can exhaustively deal with the causes of social phenomena. If we think about the law, after all, it's something that is equipped to deal with the symptoms, not the causes. If we are interested in educating people for social change, this really has to be done elsewhere. It's got to be done at the level of policies and programs. It's got to be done in schools and communities. As well as through the power of the state, through our parliaments and our laws, such work must be conducted through the habits of civil society. Changing attitudes and values, ultimately, is work that we must do in our family, in our work, our churches, our sporting clubs, and our neighbourhoods. At the same time, let there be no mistake, there remains more to be done in providing formal legal guarantees against racial discrimination. There are two current provisions of the Australian Constitution which permit governments to discriminate on the grounds of race. Section 25 of the Constitution entertains the possibility that persons of particular races can be disqualified from voting at state elections. 
Section 51, subsection 26, the so-called race power, confers on the Commonwealth Parliament the power to make laws with respect to the people of any race for whom it is deemed necessary to make special laws. As we move towards recognising Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first Australians in our constitution, it is important that we eliminate these discriminatory provisions. In my view, any Indigenous recognition should also be accompanied by a clause that explicitly prohibits racial discrimination. The constitutions of Canada, South Africa and India each prohibit racial discrimination. A similar prohibition is contained in the Bill of Rights Act 1990 in New Zealand. The Australian Constitution remains anomalous in not having anything equivalent. As a result, it remains possible for Commonwealth governments to suspend the operation of the RDA as they have on various occasions. Returning to my earlier point about social change though, the limitations of legislative protections against discrimination have, to be fair, always been explicitly recognised. I don't think there's anyone who has illusions about what the law can actually achieve. Those who introduced the Racial Discrimination Act understood perfectly that it would never be sufficient to provide a legal mechanism for complaints about discrimination. They recognised that education and policy initiatives would be vital to achieving social progress. As mentioned earlier, since 2012, such work at the Human Rights Commission has been centred on leading the national anti-racism strategy. The strategy aims to improve public understanding of racism, to empower Australians to respond to prejudice and discrimination. To give you some sense of what we do, our education work covers the workplace, schools, sport, public services, the internet. There has, for example, been curricular material that we have developed for primary and high school students in history and physical education. We've also developed guidance for employers on how to deal with cultural diversity in their workplaces. The Racism in the Stops With Me campaign is also an important part of this strategy. It invites individuals and organisations to take a pledge in standing up against racism. I think there were some pledge cards out there earlier where, uh, where you could make a pledge. You can still make a pledge, I'm sure, after uh, the lecture. But currently, there are almost 340 organisations across the country that are formal supporters of the campaign. One of our ambassadors is the AFL footballer and Australian of the Year for 2014, Adam Goods. The things that our supporters do varies. Some supporters express their commitment through public events. Some use the campaign as an opportunity to begin change within their organisation at the level of policy. We don't prescribe what support for the campaign must mean. It's important that each organisation does what is right for them. And that's because organisations will join the campaign for different reasons. Some organisations join because of local incidents involving bigotry and hatred. In country Victoria, for example, Bendigo Council supported the campaign as part of the community's response to anti-Muslim protests over the building of a mosque in the town. In the case of Ventura bus lines, the company responded to a much publicised incident on one of its buses in Melbourne, where a passenger racially abused and threatened another passenger who had been singing in French. As part of its support for the campaign, the company introduced new training for bus drivers about how to deal with racist abuse. Others, such as the 26 universities across the country who are campaign members, join because they believe it is a powerful way to build a more welcoming atmosphere within their organisation. Whatever the context, membership of the campaign is one way of expressing public commitment to racial tolerance and cultural harmony. The efforts of the campaign, however, underline one thing. 
It is crucial, vitally crucial, that we consider our personal and organisational responsibility to stand up to racism and to make our communities better places. When racism occurs, it does damage, it does harm, not and, not, and not only to feelings. It does harm to the freedom of individuals who experience it. It does harm to our society and to our values. Every time an act of prejudice or discrimination goes unchallenged, there is the danger that someone may feel empowered to deal out more of it. We're faced with some particular challenges today on race. There are signs, sadly, that some extremist groups are feeling emboldened to spout their messages of hatred and division. While organised racist movements have largely operated as fringe or underground operations, there are signs that they are becoming more confident, with their presence becoming more visible, both online and offline. There's been a recent rise in anti-Semitism, including, unfortunately, it would seem, within some university campuses. Anti-Muslim sentiments have also intensified, often taking on a racial tinge. More generally, there remains the challenge of resisting complacency. Casual and everyday forms of racism may appear to some of us, at best, to be niggling complaints about a joke or about an off-handed remark here or there. The subtle sideways glances or the soft bigotry of low expectations may appear to some of us unworthy of our attention. But if we're not careful, we can be in for some trouble. Prejudice and intolerance can quickly escalate. Low-level racism may sound benign, but it can give license to something more serious. Racism needn't involve a nasty incident of abuse on public transport before it is to be considered racism. And fighting it can more often than not mean having an important conversation with a friend or someone in your family as opposed to confronting that hostile, uh, angry stranger in a public place. Wherever racism occurs, fighting it is not easy. But as someone once said, life wasn't meant to be easy. And that is all the more cause for us to stiffen our resolve and join in saying that racism stops with us. I thank you for your support in countering racism. Your work in our universities reminds us that in achieving social change, we must necessarily rely on good citizens and not simply on good laws. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, Tim is catching a plane this evening, but he does have time for a couple of um, questions from the audience. There are roving microphones. If you just indicate, we'll get a microphone to you to ask a question. It's down here. It's on. It's on? Great. Um, hi there, Tim. Thanks very much for your talk. My name's Danny. Um, I just had a question um, about the campaign. Um, I guess my familiarity with it is pretty much what I've heard tonight. And I'm just interested in your thoughts about how the campaign can work to combat um, not just individual instances of racism but more structural. I'm thinking of high incarceration rates of Indigenous people and the like. Mm, thank you. Uh, well, as I, as I mentioned, the, the campaign is part of the National Anti-Racism Strategy and the, the strategy itself looks at some of those systemic issues in more detail. The campaign's really pitched at raising awareness and generating conversations in the general community and focusing primarily on those individual interactions that people have. But it's, of course, absolutely important that we tackle the institutional dimensions of racism. Uh, the truth of the matter is that's the much harder level at which we need to achieve change. 
Uh, our hope through the campaign and how it works with the strategy is that by having conversations in everyday life, people can then be in a position to consider the institutional barriers that still exist for many Australians, and not least to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who experience systemic discrimination in a way that no other group in our society experiences.